This is a review of Katana Guitar episode 7 through 11. This video will spoil through episode 11 of this show, so if you haven't seen it up until then, do not watch any further in this video, or you will be spoiled. Things got a lot more complicated with time travel and suicidal sisters and all these plot twists that who could have possibly seen coming. I almost don't feel properly equipped to address some of the things that happened in this group of episodes. But as with my previous review, I'm just going to go episode by episode in uh, this review as well. So let's not waste any more time and get right into it, starting with episode 7. I feel like it absolutely was not a coincidence to have Shichika and Nanami fight in episode 7, because there's so much all about the number 7 in this show. And this is a really loaded place to start, because a lot of things that have been barely referenced in the series so far really came out in this episode. I mean, Nanami got her own little episode to demonstrate just how terrifying she is, but aside from that, she's been a fairly minor character. Honestly, I'm not exactly sure if I even know now if I understand Nanami's actions as a whole. At first, I thought she only went out to look for Shichika in order to get attention from him, and so she thought that by finding a sword and creating chaos along the way, he would find her more quickly. Then maybe it was about scolding Togame, or showing Shichika how it's done. Or maybe it all came down to really just telling him about the flaw in his special move. Or maybe she just really wanted Shichika to kill her. Whatever her reason, I think this episode was an important turning point for Shichika as a character. Up until that point, we really hadn't seen him display emotion during any of his battles, even when his arm got broken or when people would insult him. Nanami made the observation and seemed a little disappointed that he appeared more human-like as opposed to sword-like, but this fight also accelerated that change rather than stop it. When he lost to the girl in the mountains, he was disappointed, but he got over it fairly quickly. When he lost to Nanami, he sulked for a few days until he was given some proper hints on how to defeat her. He began to change in the sense that he started to recognize his own humanity and his own free will, rather than just being a tool that Togame uses in order to carry out her will. As a result, he had to come to terms with the fact that he now had to choose to kill Nanami. So he improved his attacks, and he fought her again, but then he chose to save her. Of course, she didn't want to be saved, but at this point it's kind of irrelevant, because now, from now on, Shichika is going off in much more prominent ways to grow as a human rather than a sword. So now we as viewers come to expect a lot more emotion and personality from Shichika. And so then we moved on to episode 8, and a lot happened in episode 8, including Shichika continuing to show that he is more of a human than a sword. He was able to recognize and then pity the doll and look at the fighting style and reflect on how he used to be like that. Shichika gradually became aware of social situations and would become annoyed if people made fun of him or if he didn't want to do something. Now that he didn't really have any ties back to his island where he came from, he stopped thinking about eventually going back there. It's been really fun to see his evolution from a sword into a person, and having Togame being there to watch it all happen. Their unusual relationship never really changes, even though she was all scared that he would stop liking her after her haircut. He still admires her and her intelligence and her plan-making abilities, but she's not so high above him that he can't make fun of her. As far as plot goes, this episode introduced Princess Hite, who is really just confusing at this point. Later on we'd come to learn that maybe she's this or that, but her motives are still very unclear. It could be just that she wants the swords for herself, or it might be a personal vendetta against Togame. But she's very sneaky and she does have a Shichika of her own, Emon Zaimon, though he hinted to the fact that that's not his real name. He has a beef with the Maniwa ninjas, though he said many times that he's over it and he just wants to serve the princess. I struggle with the Amon Zaimon subplot because I really like the battles, but I'm having such a difficult time taking the Maniwa ninjas seriously already because one or more of them seems to die in every episode. Still, I won't lie and say that it isn't incredibly fascinating that one of the swords is a gun. Episode 9 was there to strengthen the relationship between Shichika and Togame. Even though they spent most of the episodes separated, and the time they did spend together, they were bickering, 
I think it only further proved how precious their relationship is. Togame showed her love for Shichika by becoming incredibly jealous that he was spending time with another woman. And Shichika showed his love for Togame by it never even occurring to him that he could hook up with another woman. As a whole, I did think that this episode was a little bit weaker than some of the ones that we've seen so far, especially considering the one that follows it. It was very repetitive, and it included the same gag several times of Togame misunderstanding a situation that was innocent, but it looked scandalous. It was also a lingering look at something that had already been established previously with just one sentence. Shichika physically cannot use a sword. This is a concept that would come back later to be described as a curse, which does make Shichika uncomfortable, although I do think that this was a concept that was already thoroughly explained enough and didn't need this much time dedicated to it. But are we supposed to interpret that kiss shown between Shichika and Togame as being their first kiss? Based on Shichika's reaction, it seems to me like it's something he's never experienced before. But they've been traveling together for nine months, so that just seems crazy that they wouldn't have already done it. And while all that's happening, Eimon Zaimon goes off to kill ho -Oh, but ends up settling for another Maniwa ninja. The Maniwa have come across a sword, which ho -Oh is hanging onto, but that's not Eimon Zaimon's actual goal. He wants to get revenge because the Maniwa wiped out his clan. But of course, he abandoned the way of the ninja, so that's why it's acceptable for him to use a gun. I'm beginning to sense a trend in anime where they try to animate wacky dreams. And I kind of saw that as episode 10's attempt. To a degree, of course. It was all about looking at your own memories and holding up a mirror to your subconscious. By doing so, you're able to understand the real truth of your memories and come to terms with your trauma. They also slipped in this other thing about channeling your power to offense or defense or choosing one or the other and figuring out what real strength is. But it was interesting to finally learn about Togame's past and her relationship with her father, while also forcing her to do physical labor. Shichika was also forced to relive memories of women in the past who defeated him, and also the regret of having to kill certain women. And I did think it was interesting that they were all women. Actually, this is a super equal opportunity show if you look back at all of the sword owners so far. Of the ten swords collected so far, you can eliminate the genderless doll and the genderless holy man. So of the eight that have been collected, half of them were women and half of them were men. And because Shichika is a character who doesn't really see gender, all of their sexes are incidental, really. And that's what makes it really interesting, in my opinion. Not because I'm a crazy feminazi who wants to see only women being more important than men, but because the show isn't shirking on its responsibility to make good female characters. I really like Togama, even though she's whiny and loud and very girly. That's okay. She doesn't have to be badass and serious in order to be a good female character. She just has to be well-rounded. You shouldn't be able to get away with saying that you can't write female characters, because there's really nothing to it. Writing for a woman is the same as writing for a man. You just have to decide whether to give your character boobs or a dick. On that note, <laughs> let's move on to episode 11. It became pretty obvious early on in the episode what was going to happen at the end, because the discussion about what they were going to do in the future happened three times. Once is foolish. Twice is dangerous. Three times, she signed her own death warrant especially this close to the end of the series. She might as well have been the army guy at the beginning of the movie talking about his pregnant girlfriend or the fact that he was gonna marry her when he got back. Dead. Yeah, immediately. But still incredibly shocking, I feel. I mean, as soon as I saw Amon Zaimon coming up over the hill, I knew exactly what was going to happen, but still, still kind of took my breath away. And even before that, we had a face-off with two different Maniwa Ninja. I honestly thought Pankin was going to live, and I don't know why, because we've seen, at that point, ten other Maniwa Ninjas killed. No mercy. But maybe it was just the brutality of it that shocked me, and the fact that he's a little kid, and they built up his power to be badass, and Togame went out of her way to spare him. Whatever it was, I was definitely irked by the suddenness and the manner of his death. And then the fight against Ho-Oh was 
difficult because we as viewers are left to interpret whether Ho'o was just crazy or if he really was possessed by Shikizaki Kiki's dead spirit. Based on what we decide, we determine whether Shikizaki Kiki was a swordsman who was just very ahead of his time or he could see the future and use future technology to make swords. Whichever we decide on, we did get to see the flashback to confirm that yes, Shikizaki Kiki did inspire Shichika's ancestor to make the no sword style. In that sense, yes, Shichika is kind of the 13th sword, the final creation. It is likely that, given Togame's famous fragility, she really is dead, and if that's the case, then the swords now belong to Shichika. Eimon Zaimon is clearly there to take them, however, so maybe Shichika's quest, which is motivated by love, will turn into a quest which is motivated by revenge. To fulfill Togame's goal, and to gather all the swords together. And probably to defeat the Princess Hite and Eimon Zaimon, because at this point they're just asking for it. My next video for this show will obviously be a watching of episode 12, and then after that will just be a series review. I've really liked the series up until now, and I, I really hope that the finale does it justice. See you next time for episode 12. Bye!